Welcome to our reading on intercorporate investments with me, John Bone. Now, intercorporate investments are really spanned by three learning outcomes that are going to cover this entire reading. Our first learning outcome is to describe the classification, measurement and disclosure of, essentially, our intercorporate investments. And the types of intercorporate investments covered by this are financial assets, so these are largely passively held assets, associates, where we have an influence over another company, joint ventures where we have shared control, business combinations, in other words, subsidiaries where we have outright control, and also special purpose uh, entities or special purpose vehicles. So yes, we're going to have to describe the classification, disclosure and measurement of these, uh, of these investments. We also have to distinguish between US GAAP and IFRS. And then finally, we need to be able to analyse the impacts of the accounting methods on our financial statements and ratios. And as I said, those three learning outcomes span the entire reading. So let's have a look at our first slide. Now our first slide is looking at the uh, investment categories here. Now notice the classification of intercorporate investments is based on degree of influence or control. Now one thing we used to do, especially under US GAAP, is they used to look at percentage of ownership. Now these percentage of ownership used to be referred to as bright line criteria. Now, you should be aware that post-accounting scandals such as Enron, the bright line criteria are now an indication, but they're not the outright rule. So we're really looking for any instances where we have control or influence. Whether we have one share or a hundred shares is rather irrelevant. So bright line criteria, notice, is now only used as a guide. Now, typically then, looking at our bright line criteria here, we've got less than 20% ownership. Key though is these are passive investments. If we have passive investments, we have no influence, no control over the other entities, entities investing, operating or financial decisions. We're going to refer to these as financial assets and we're going to see that there are three major classifications and a kind of fourth add-on one for those. Now if we have an influence over the, uh, the other entity, so we influence its financing, its investing, its operating decisions, again the old bright line criteria were between 20 and 50% uh, ownership, then we're going to refer to these as associates. Now IFRS refers to them as associates, often in the US you get, her, get them referred to as affiliates. So be aware in your exam, use associates and affiliates interchangeably. Key point is we have influence but not outright control. Now, if we have control over the other entity, then we're talking about business combinations. Essentially, here we're talking about subsidiaries where we do control the investing, the financing, and the day-to-day -day business operations. Again, the bright line criteria used to be greater than 50% share ownership because, of course, once you had 50% share ownership, you could essentially appoint and remove directors, i.e. you had control of the company. Be aware as well, we're going to look at shared control. Uh, when we have shared control, we're going to talk about joint ventures and joint operations as well. So let's start off with our financial assets. And again, remember our buzzword for these is passive. So no influence, no control over the other entity. Now there are three major classifications, if you like, and then a fourth kind of add-on one. First ma major classification we have is held to maturity. Now, again, phrase there, maturity, gives you a good clue that these apply only to debt securities. Of course, equity tends to be perpetual, it doesn't have any maturity date. So these are debt securities where the company has two things, both the intent and the ability to hold to maturity. So we're intending not to sell these securities prior to maturity. Now the significance is they're going to go into our balance sheet at amortised cost. Then we're going to report income in our income statement. Now of course notice the income in our income statement because it's debt securities that we're holding here is interest income. Be careful though. Unless the security was bought at par value, the interest income is very unlikely to equal the coupon. In fact, the interest income, if we bought the bond at a discount to its par value, then the interest income is going to be equal to the discount, sorry, the coupon plus the amortised discount. And if we bought the security at a premium, then our interest income is going to be equal to 
the coupon minus the amortized premium. Now this may ring certain bells with you because again you were looking at this at level one, not from the perspective of owning bonds, but there you were looking at companies that had issued bonds. But the same, same logic, the interest expense at level one on a bond that had been issued at a discount was coupon plus amortized discount. And of course, if the bond had been issued at a premium, coupon minus amortized premium. So it's exactly the same mechanics at play here, only we own the bonds rather than have issued the bonds. So this time we're talking about interest income rather than interest expense. Now, of course, in the balance sheet, notice they're initially reported at cost, purchase price, including any transaction costs under US GAAP. Now, IFRS says they're initially reported at their fair value, including transaction costs. Now, what's the difference, cost and fair value? In my mind, really very little indeed. I mean, I guess you could buy a security below its fair value, but it seems rather unlikely. So initially, what we're really doing under both IFRS and US GAAP is we're, we're recording these securities in the balance sheet. We're recording our investment at cost. Now, again, you might have bought that investment at a discount to par, at a premium to par, or I guess in a more unlikely situation, at par value itself. So notice, in the balance sheet, we're going to carry these at our amortized cost. Now, what that's going to mean is if you bought the bond at a discount to par, initially it goes in at the price paid, but then we're going to amortize that discount and the value of the asset is going to increase until the as value of the asset is par at the maturity date. Likewise, if you bond, bought a bond at a premium, the initial investment is going to go in there at the price paid. We're then going to amortize the premium so the asset value falls down to par value. The idea, of course, is we're aiming to have an asset value that is equal to par at the maturity date of our security. That way, of course, essentially when the bond matures, we receive in the par value, the face value of the bond, and we de-recognize essentially the asset, which is also par value, giving us no gain on or loss in the, in the income statement. Essentially, proceeds are equal to asset value at maturity. Now, changes in market value under held to maturity, key point here is they are not reflected in the financial statements. Now, of course, there is an exception to that, and that is if they're impaired. So in other words, if the fair value, if the market value has declined below the carrying value in the balance sheet, so decline below amortized cost in the balance sheet, and we believe that decline is uh, permanent, then essentially we have an impairment and the security needs to be written down uh, to the recoverable amount. Now notice as well, these securities, we're meant to have both the intent and the ability to hold to maturity. If we do dispose of the security prior to maturity, there are repercussions. Now again, notice if we sell prior to maturity, we may end up with a disallowance of the held to maturity classification. In other words, this company may not be allowed to use held to maturity going forward. So any securities that remain in held to maturity would need to be transferred out and we wouldn't use, be able to use this classification going forward. That is known as tainting your held to maturity. Okay, so that's held to, uh, our held to maturity only applies to debt securities and we're held, holding in the balance sheet at amortized cost. Now, our second classification is what US GAAP calls held for trading, what IFRS calls fair value through profit or loss. Now, this can apply to debt and equity securities. And note, these have been acquired for the purpose of selling in the near future. So these are really speculatively held investments here. Now, the idea is in the income statement, we're going to show interest and dividend income. Interest, of course, if it's a bond, dividend income, of course, uh, if it's equity. Now, be aware that the interest income that we show is exactly the same as the held to maturity classification. In other words, it's not simply the coupon. It would be the coupon plus amortized discount. and the coupon minus any amortization of any premium. So actually, the interest revenue that we show on debt securities is going to be the same under held to maturity. It's going to be the same under held for trading. It's also going to be the same under our third classification, 
available for sale. It's always not simply the coupon, it's always coupon plus amortized discount minus amortized premium. Just watch out for that. Okay, and again, look, we have got that being made in this point. It's not simply the coupon. The only time the interest received is equal to the coupon on debt securities, of course, is if you purchase that security at par. Now, we're going to carry in the balance sheet, and here's the key point. In the balance sheet, we are going to record at fair value. Now, of course, that leads us to the potential of making unrealized gains and losses. Now, remember, unrealized gains and losses are gains and losses caused by fluctuations in the fair value on securities that we still hold at the year end. So if we're going to record the balance sheet asset at fair value, we are going to generate unrealized gains and losses. The key for our exam is to know exactly where those unrealized gains and losses appear. And here is, of course, where they appear under trading securities. We're going to take them through the income statement. Therefore, as we make unrealized gains and losses, they are going to have an effect on the company's earnings. Now, let's have a look at available for sale. Again, applies to debt or equity securities. Here, we're defining them as, well, they're not held to maturity, they're not trading securities. Really, we often refer to these as securities that may be, uh, may be disposed of uh, for liquidity purposes. Now, again, interest and dividend income is going to go into the income statement. Yet again, note, of course, that that interest income on debt securities is not simply coupon. Coupon plus any amortization of discount if you bought the bond at a discount. Coupon minus the amortization of a premium if you bought the bond at a premium. Now, just like our trading securities, in the balance sheet, these are going to be recorded at fair value. Now, so far, everything is exactly the same as our trading securities. So where does the difference lie? Well, the difference lies on, in where the unrealized gains and losses go. On a trading security, they went via the income statement and affected that year's earnings. Here, with available for sale, they do not go via the income statement. So notice they're going to be reported directly in stockholders' equity, in the area of stockholders' equity referred to as OCI, other comprehensive income. Okay, so direct equity, not via the income statement, is your key point to take here. Notice, of course, then, when we physically sell these securities, then we show a realized gain or loss in the income statement. So realized gains and losses are always actually on the physical disposal. Now, those are our three major classifications. As I said, there is a kind of fourth classification, and that is designated at fair value. Now, notice the management has the option, and it is an option, to report any financial assets and liabilities that would otherwise be treated as either held to maturity or available for sale at fair value. In other words, we might have a security that strictly meets the criteria of held to maturity or available for sale, but we have an, the ability to elect to treat it as if it was a trading security. Okay, so we're going to treat it like a trading security. We're going to record fair value in the balance sheet. But here's the key, the unrealized gains and losses on assets that we still hold at year end are going to go via the income statement, just like a trading security. Okay, let's have a little overview, essentially, of our security classifications and our three major ones here. So let's have a look at balance sheet and income statement. Trading securities, otherwise known as fair value through profit or loss under IFRS, in the balance sheet, fair value. So we're going to mark these securities to market at the year-end dates. Now, of course, what that means is we are going to generate un unrealized gains and losses due to the mark to marketing uh, effect as we adjust these securities to fair value in the balance sheet. Now, those unrealized gains and losses, of course, will go via the income statement, essentially, for our trading securities. What else hits the income statement? Well, dividends, of course, if we're looking at equity. Interest, of course, if we're looking at bonds. And remember, it's interest income this time. Remember, again, I'm going to say this one more time. The interest income in the income statement is not simply the coupon. It's the coupon plus any amortized discount. It's the coupon minus any amortized premium. Other thing we're going to see is any realized gains and losses on the actual disposal of these securities. 
Let's turn our attention to health to maturity, the actual absolute flip side of these. Now, of course, in the balance sheet, we are not seeing fair value reported. Instead, we're seeing amortized costs. So initially the security is reported at, of course, purchase price, but we're then going to amortize any discount or premium. As we amortize the discount, then of course the investment value is going to climb to par value, face value over time. If we amortize any premium, then of course the investment value is going to decline to face value over time. So that's what amortized cost is. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Now, of course, interest uh, realized should uh, interest should hit the income statement and our interest coupon plus amortized discount coupon minus amortized premium. Realized gains and losses. OK, what about our realized gains and losses? Well, hmm, remember, we should be holding to maturity. And if we hold the security to maturity at the redemption date, there is no gain or loss because we receive face value and the asset is sitting there at face value, giving you no gain or loss at maturity. So to see realized gains and losses would imply that we're disposing of these securities prior to maturity. And of course, if we do that, remember, we will taint our held to maturity and we won't be able to use it going forward. So strictly speaking, we shouldn't really be seeing gains and losses on disposals prior to maturity. Let's take our available for sale, our halfway house if you like. Balance sheet, of course, recorded at fair value, but this time the unrealized gains and losses are not going via the income statement. They're going direct into our stockholders' equity, remember, in our other comprehensive income. In the income statement, dividends, interest, of course, dividends if it's equity, interest if it's debt, and of course our realized gains and losses on actual disposals. Now, let's have a look at our cash flows. Notice any cash flows we receive, so dividends and interest. Now, I don't like calling interest received a, a cash flow here because, of course, a component of the interest income is the amortization of either the discount or the premium, which inherently is a non-cash element to it. The coupon is really the cash flow element. But be aware that we're really saying interest income is going to go through the income statement really under all three methods as our realized gains and losses on physical disposal. Unrealized gains and losses will only hit the income statement under trading securities. They go direct to stockholders' equity for available for sale and they are not reported anywhere, of course, for held to maturity. OK, now, uh, we need to be aware of a difference uh, between international accounting standards and US GAAP. Well, notice our trading securities. OK, there is a difference in name. US GAAP calls them trading. IFRS calls them fair value through profit or loss, indicating that the fair value adjustments hit the profit or loss account, which, of course, is just another name for the income statement. Apart from that, the treatment essentially is exactly the same. So there is really no difference for trading securities. So here's the key one. It's really our available for sale securities. Now again, notice it's foreign exchange gains and losses on debt securities. Now, the idea here is you hold an overseas a bond. OK, so now at the end of each year, there are really two sources of unrealized gain or loss. There is the fluctuation of the bond value in its domestic currency, and there's also the fluctuation in our reporting currency caused by changes in the exchange rate. Now, US GAAP, you do not have to split the two sources of gain or loss out. You can take them all into stockholders' equity within your other comprehensive income. Under IFRS, for debt securities, we do have to split it out. We have to take the unrealized gain or loss caused by fluctuations in the security in its domestic currency to stockholders' equity, unrealized gains and losses caused by a fluctuating exchange rate and therefore impacting on our reporting currency, that goes to the income statement. So watch out, FX gains and losses have to go to the income statement on debt securities per IFRS. Again, notice our held to maturity, uh, of course, uh, amortized cost the, uh, uh, for both methods. And again, no difference between US GAAP and IFRS. So focus in there on that available for sale difference. OK, so our debt instruments, remember, held to maturity. 
couponing the income statement and the amortization of the discount or premium. Amortizing a discount is going to mean that the coupon essentially is smaller than the interest income. Okay, if we amortize a premium, it means that the coupon essentially is bigger than the interest income. Okay, remember, coupon plus amortized discount or coupon minus amortized premium. In our balance sheet, always, of course, amortized cost. Amortizing a discount is going to increase the asset value over time. Amortizing a premium is going to decrease the value of the asset over time. Remember, under both, the goal is that we end up with an asset that is equal to the face value of the bond at maturity. Available for sale, uh, interest income is exactly the same as before, coupon plus amortized discount minus amortized premium. Difference, of course, is in the balance sheet, we're recording the asset now at fair value rather than amortized cost. And of course, our unrealized gains and losses are being taken directly into stockholders' equity. And then our final classification, trading or fair value through profit or loss. Now, of course, interest income, the same under all three methods. So again, coupon plus amortized discount, coupon minus amortized premium. But we're also seeing our unrealized gains and losses due to the fair value adjustments hitting the income statement this time. In the balance sheet, asset recorded at fair value. Okay, let's have a look for our debt securities. The fair value of a debt security minus amortized cost gives us our cumulative unrealized gain for the period. Okay, so notice with debt securities, we're going to compare fair value to amortized cost and that gives us the cumulative unrealized gain on the security. Now, of course, that cumulative unrealized gain, if we're looking at available for sale, we'll actually be able to see that figure sitting in stockholders' equity. If we're looking at trading securities, we won't be able to see it anywhere. We'll, in fact, the change in the cumulative unrealized gain or loss will be going through the income statement each period. Okay, so notice when we're looking at the cumulative unrealized gain or loss, and when I say cumulative, I mean really since the date of purchase, then we're comparing fair value at the end of the year to amortize cost at the end of the year for debt securities. Now again, what people, the mistake that people will make is rather than looking at amortized cost, they will use purchase price. Okay, no, 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 no. We don't use purchase price due to amortization of discounts and premiums. Okay, now look for equity securities, we do. Working out the cumulative unrealized gain on those, we're going to look at the fair value compared to the historic purchase price. And that's going to work fine because we're not going to be amortizing any discounts and premiums, essentially. We don't amortize the security so it moves to par value over time. There is no redemption on equity. Okay. Now, notice the unrealized gain for or loss for the period is the change in the cumulative unrealized gain or loss. Okay, so in other words, uh, if you're looking at a debt security, I'll need to look at the cumulative unrealized gain this year, the cumulative unrealized gain last year, and look at the change to get this year's debt gain or loss. Exactly the same for equity. Look at the cumulative amount this year end, cumulative amount last year end, and look at the change to pick up on the unrealized gain or loss for the period. Again, a key point, we may well be calculating these numbers for our exam. So let's jump straight into an example here. We've got Acme Corporation. They purchased a three-year, 6% annual coupon bond, and it was purchased there for $953. Market yield at the time of purchase, 10%. Bond was trading at $950 at the end of year one, and Acme sold our bond at the end of year two for $955. Determine the balance sheet and income statement effects if the bond is classified as held to maturity, trading or available for sale. OK, now, first of all, we're going to need to look at bond amortization. And this is really a refresher. Uh, if you remember, it was in level one. OK, we were looking at bonds that we issued rather than bonds that we purchased. But the mechanics are exactly the same. So here's our opening carrying value, which, of course, is the original purchase price. We then take the market rate at the time of purchase, the yield at the time of purchase, apply it to the carrying value. Now, our market rate in this particular example was 10%. So 10% of the carrying value, 
that gives us our interest income for the year 90.05. Now this bond uh, had a coupon of 6%, it's an annual paying bond, 6% uh, of its par value, $1,000 par value here gives us 60. The difference between the interest income and the coupon, of course, must be the amortization. In other words, remember, interest income is the coupon plus the amortized discount. Now, what is the discount that we're amortizing? The difference between the original purchase price and the face value. So here, the difference between $1,000, uh, the face value, and the purchase price of 953 now, essentially then, what we can do to actually spot the amortization is look at the difference in our interest income and the difference in the coupon, and that gives us amortization of 30.05 in year one. We're going to take that amortization. It's added to the coupon to get the interest income in the income statement. It's also added to the assets value. So at the end of year one, beginning of year two, the asset value is now 900.53, plus year one's amortization of 30 spot 05, giving us a value at the end of year one, beginning of year two of 93058. Year two's interest income, we take the market rate at the time of purchase, the 10%, and we apply it to the opening investment value, opening carrying value at the start of the year. Remember, carrying value simply means balance sheet value. So 93058 times 10%, gives us interest income in year two of $93.06. Our coupon is a nice flat $60, of course, each period. The amortization, therefore, the difference between the two, and we end up with $33.06 in year two. Now, again, that amortization is added to the interest, so the interest income is $93.06 in the income statement, and it's added to the asset value. So our asset value now increases from 93058 to 96364. Interest income for the third year, 10% of that figure, so 9636. Compare that to the coupon, and we've got amortization in year three of 3636. Uh, Add that, of course, to the uh, uh, asset value of 96364, and at the end of year three, then, of course, the asset would be sitting at $1,000. And of course, that means when we de-recognize the asset on redemption, there's going to be no gain or loss in the income statement. Because essentially, the proceeds we receive, well, when a bond receive, re redeems, you get its par value. So we get the face value on this bond compared to the asset that we've de-recognizing, which of course is also now 1,000, meaning essentially the gain or loss hitting the income statement is a big fat zero. And that, of course, is hitting the income statement. So there is no p impact on the income statement if we hold our bond to maturity, of course. Now, again, if you uh, want to see how to do bond amortization on the calculator, and it can be done using the amortization function, which you find above the present value button on the BAT+, Plus, again, you can refer to the calculator guide uh, that is in the, uh, the Swayze tutorials on your uh, online interface. Right, okay, so let's have a look at underheld to maturity. At the end of year one, then we're going to be showing amortized cost. Okay, and now of course, at the end of year one, we've got the original purchase price of $900.53. We've got one year's amortization of $30.50, uh, sorry, $30.05. Add the two together. So that's what's going on in our balance sheet. We've got this increase, and remember, it's increasing slowly towards face value over the life of the bond. Interest income in the income statement, of course, $90.05. In other words, we're seeing the coupon plus the amortization of that discount, okay? Now again, alternatively, take the opening carrying value, the 900.53, and apply the effective rate at the time of purchase, the 10% yield at the time of purchase. Now, if we sell for 955 at the beginning of year two, well, number one, we're going to be in trouble because we, this is a held to maturity security, so it should not have been disposed of prior to maturity. It will be tainted. We won't be able to use this classification anymore. Okay, but let's have a look at what the realized gain would be. Now, the realized gain here is fairly straightforward. 
What we got to do is compare the proceeds. And we sold this security at the beginning of year two for 955. So there's our sales proceeds. And we just compare it to the carrying value at the end of the previous year. And of course, our carrying value at the end of the previous year was 93058. So we sold essentially and received 955, the carrying value at the last balance sheet date. Nine three zero fifty eight, giving us a realised gain on disposal of twenty four forty two. So be careful with the realised gain. Notice its proceeds compared to the carrying value at the last balance sheet date. It is not proceeds compared to original purchase price, and that's because we're amortising the discount and treating it as income in the income statement, treating it as interest income in the income statement. Okay, there's a there's health and maturity. Let's now have a look at. Uh, trading securities, in other words, fair value through profit or loss. Key is in the balance sheet now, we are going to see our investment recorded at fair value. And in this question, we're told that the fair value at the end of year one is $950. Now, be aware of that $950 is really made up of two components. It's made up of the amortized cost. Okay, and we can take that as if it was a held to maturity security, 93058. The remaining difference is essentially, in this case, the unrealized gain. So here we've got an unrealized gain of $19, essentially, and 42 cents. So again, be very careful. The cumulative unrealized gain, now of course, cumulative is the same as this year's unrealized gain because we're looking at year one here. But in subsequent years, remember, the cumulative unrealized gain is the total unrealized gain or loss since inception, since the purchase of the security. So notice, to calculate that, all we're ever doing is looking at the fair value of the security, the market value of the security, compared to amortized cost, 1942. Okay, now again, look at the interest income in here. The interest income is not simply the coupon, it is the coupon plus the amortization of our premium. So notice 60 plus the amortization of our, did I say premium? I should have said discount. It's the coupon plus the amortization of the discount. So notice we get 90 spot 05 here. We've got exactly the same interest income that we had under held to maturity. Notice the other element, of course, well, the balance sheet asset shows an unrealized gain of 1942. We reflect fair value there. The unrealized gain for the year, and remember, that's the change in the unrealized gain. So, of course, remember, we've got a value of zero at the start of the year for our unrealized gain because we didn't own the security there. And we've got 1942, the cumulative amount at the end of the year. So this year's unrealized gain is actually 1942. So just be careful, remember, it's always the change in the cumulative unrealized gain that is that year's unrealized gain per the income statement. So there it is, 1942. Okay, so that's our trading security. So let's have a look at the, uh, <coughs> you can see the periodic unrealized gain. There you go. Here's the cumulative unrealized gain at the end of the year. Here's the cu cumulative unrealized gain at the start of the year giving us an unrealized gain of 1942 that's hitting our income statement. Now, of course, then we sell for $955 at the beginning of year two. Now, be careful here because we're going to re reverse the unrealized gain from the previous year, 1952, and replace it with a realized gain of 2442. Okay, so notice the 1942 is just a cumulative unrealized gain that's at the, uh, sitting uh, there from the previous period, essentially. So we're going to reverse that and replace it with a realized gain. Now notice our realized gain essentially is computed as sale price or sale proceeds compared to amortized cost. There we go. So we reverse the unrealized gains because these have been recognized in previous periods. In this case, 
This was recognized in year one, and we've replaced it with a realized gain of 24.42. That means, of course, the net impact in our income statement is going to be a $5 gain on disposal. Now, again, there's another way of jumping to that $5 gain on disposal. What we can essentially do is we can look at 955, the sales proceeds. compared to 950, which is the fair value at the last balance sheet date. Okay, so we had it recorded in our balance sheet at the end of year one at 950. We sold for 955 and that jumps us straight down to that $5 uh, gain, realized gain essentially on disposal. Okay. Let's turn our attention now to available for sale. In the balance sheet, we're going to record at 950 again. So again, note that we're seeing the fair value in the balance sheet. But again, be aware that that's made up of two component elements. You've got the amortized cost component. And then the balance taking us up to the fair value of the security is our unrealized gain. Now, of course, it's our cumulative unrealized gain. So the difference between 950, it's fair value, and the amortized cost, 93058, is the cumulative unrealized gain. And we'll see this figure sitting in stockholders' equity within other comprehensive income under available for sale. Now again, remember, if we wanted to know what this year's unrealized gain is, it would be the change in the cumulative amount. Notice in the income statement, again, we're seeing interest income of 90 spot 05. So again, this is going to be the coupon plus the amortized discount. So the $60 coupon plus the amortization of 30 spot 05. Notice the interest income has been the same under all three methods so far. Now, we now sell the security for 955 at the beginning of year two. Now, notice this time, the whole realized gain is uh, 2442. Now, this 2442 is equal to the sale proceeds compared to amortized cost at the previous balance sheet date. Why? Because no unrealized gains and losses have ever impacted the income statement. So we're going to record a realized gain of 2442 and then notice we eliminate the 1942, the unrealized gains that are sitting in our other comprehensive income. Notice that's very different from trading securities. The issue with trading securities is 1942 had already gone through the income statement in year one and therefore we only needed to show the difference between what had gone through in previous years and the total realized gain. In other words, the difference between 2442 and 1942 needed to be shown on disposal, the $5. Okay, so hopefully now we understand the accounting treatment of our passive investments. We also really need to focus on whether we can reclassify between the classifications. Let's imagine if we can for a second. Well, if we can reclassify between those three classifications, every time uh, fair values are increasing in the market, in other words, we're looking at a bullish market with prices rising, I'm going to want to treat it as a trading security so I can book unrealized gains straight through the income statement. Now, of course, every time prices rise, i.e. a bear, sorry, start to fall, i.e. a bearish market, so our prices are declining, I'm going to want to treat it as either available for sale or even better, held to maturity. Why? To keep unrealized losses out of the income statement. Now let's have a look at these. Now notice, under US GAAP, I can classify from held for trading, from trading securities that affect the income statement, to both available for sale and held to maturity. So I can go in to held for trading, uh, from held for trading into available for sale or held to maturity and vice versa. So I can classify in and out of the income statement. Okay. Now, of course, uh, when I do classify from held to trading into uh, either uh, available for sale or held to maturity, then I essentially any unrealized gain or loss at that point needs to be recorded in the income statement. Now notice we've put a star there and that star, if you look at it, 
is simply saying prohibited under IFRS. So IFRS is not going to allow you to classify into and out of trading securities. This shuts down the ability to essentially, uh, in, a, in a bullish market, treat it as a trading security and in bearish markets, shift it to available for sale or trading. Not possible under IFRS. We cannot classify into or out. Now notice, held to maturity can be, or held to maturity can be reclassified as held to trading under US GAAP only. Any unrealized gain or loss at that point gets recorded in the income statement. Notice both, both US GAAP and IFRS allow us to classify between held to maturity and available for sale. Any unrealized gain when we take it out of held to maturity would be then taken directly into other comprehensive income. In other words, we record the security at fair value when we make the change. So we can, under IFRS, it does allow you to reclassify from available for sale to held to maturity and the other way, held to maturity to available for sale. But what we're not allowed to do is go into the income statement. In other words, between fair value through profit or loss and the other two categories. US GAAP, of course, does. So notice, if we go from available for sale to held to maturity, we've got a bit of a problem there. What happens to the amount sitting in other comprehensive income? Well, the key is it's going to be amortized over the remaining life of the security. Available for sale into held to maturity, uh, sorry, held for trading. Well, again, note, of course, here, it is allowed under US GAAP. It isn't under IFRS. Now, again, when we do that, anything that's been sitting in other comprehensive income is going to come out of other comprehensive income and hit the income statement. Okay, so all transfers are made at fair value at the date of the transfer. Significance then, let's just rec recap this because I think this is significant. US GAAP allows you to reclassify into and out of trading securities. IFRS, of course, does not. It allows you to reclassify between available for sale and held to maturity, but not in and out of trading securities. Again, just be careful because IFRS doesn't call them trading securities. Remember, it calls them fair value through profit or loss. Now, be aware of a new standard, essentially, that we have, uh, applicable from the first of the first, so the first of January uh, 2018, but early adoption allowed. Now, IFRS is slightly changing. We're now going to have three classifications again. They're going to be amortized costs that applies to debt securities. Hey, look, this is just held to maturity. Nothing different there. What is different and what I think you need to focus on is there are now two conditions set out for it to be treated as amortized cost. Number one, the business model test. How the asset is managed. In other words, it looks at your portfolios and says, do you hold to maturity? If the answer is yes, then you're going to be able to use this classification. If the answer is no, sometimes we dispose of securities prior to maturity, then you're not. So first of all, it looks at how portfolios are managed. Then we move to the second point, cash flow characteristic test. This looks at the cash flows that the securities are generating. And it says, broadly speaking, can we classify them as either interest or principal? If we can, then we're going to say these are debt instruments and therefore we can use the amortized cost. So be aware, business model test, cash flow characteristic test. And that's what I think is really important to take into the exam with you. OK, now notice the accounting treatment. It's exactly the same as held to maturity. In fact, the name amortized cost almost gives this away. So we're going to store a purchase price. Then we're going to amortize discounts or amortize premiums over the life of the security until the asset converges to face value at maturity. We then have fair value through profit or loss. So these are our, our, what US GAAP calls trading securities. So we're going to record fair value in the balance sheet. And then we're going to take unrealized gains and losses directly into stockholders' equity. Now, here is our third classification, fair value through other comprehensive income. Per the CFA Institute material, we are saying that this only applies 
to equity securities. Now you should be aware that actually the accounting standards have changed due to an exposure draft which has delayed uh, the initial um, introduction of this standard. Originally it was meant to be introduced in 2015 but it's been delayed all the way back to 2018 because of industry lobbying. And one thing that they have been lobbying on is that fair value to OCI should be extended to debt securities. Okay, they have been successful in that. So in practice, fair value through OCI will apply to debt and equity, but currently our syllabus is saying it is only equity. Now that leaves people in a quandary. What should they do in the exam? Well, unless the institute er issue an errata at any point, then you go with what is written in the book. So in other words, fair value through other comprehensive income only applies to equity securities as it stands in our syllabus. Reclassification, now notice our choice, fair value through profit or loss, or fair value through other comprehensive income, is a one-way choice. You choose once, you cannot change your mind. There is no reclassification there of equity securities between trading securities and what essentially is available for sale. Okay, no great shocks. We're not allowed to do it already in the, in the current fair value through profit or loss and available for sale. We can't reclassify under IFRS and hey, look, we're not going to be able to classify under the new scheme either. Notice reclassification of debt securities from amortized cost to fair value through profit or loss is permitted. Now, remember under the current rules where we have um, essentially held to maturity and fair value through profit or loss, we are not allowed to reclassify in or out per IFRS. Uh, in or out of uh, fair value through profit or loss. The new rules are going to allow us to reclassify in or out of fair value through profit or loss, but only if the business model has changed. In other words, we would need to be able to demonstrate that essentially we've gone from a model where we were holding uh, to maturity, holding portfolios to maturity, to a model, a business model, where we're actually trading in securities, trading in debt instruments, and retiring some of them prior to maturity, or redeeming some of them prior to maturity. So we do need to prove that our business model has changed and we're no longer holding debt securities all the way to maturity. Okay, reclassification, unrecognized gains and losses on debt securities carried at amortized cost and reclassified as fair value through profit or loss would be taken to the income statement. So essentially this transition, if you change it from amortized cost to fair value through profit or loss, immediately you're changing the carrying value from amortized cost to fair value. So that's going to give you an unrealized gain straight or loss straight away and you take that to the income statement. Notice debt securities that are transferred the other way from fair value through profit or loss to amortized cost, transferred at fair value on the transfer date, and that is the new carrying amount. We almost treat the security as if it's been purchased at fair value, and then we amortize the discount or premium from this point onwards. In other words, we look at the fair value, that becomes, if you like, the purchase price, compare that to face value and amortize that over the remaining uh, uh, bond's life. Okay, so actually these two points are no different from what we're doing currently. Okay, let's turn our attention now to investments in associates and joint ventures. Now, investments in associates and joint ventures, we have to use what is known as the equity method. Okay, now, equity method was something that was very briefly mentioned at level one, but never really explained. Now, we're now going to see that it's the method, the accounting method, that we use for our significant influence investments and shared control investments. Now, again, the key point here is that you have influence over investing, operating and financing decisions, but not right, outright control. And as we said, it now includes joint ventures. Now, in the balance sheet, we're going to report initially at cost. So originally, we report at cost being the purchase price, the price we pay to acquire the equity in our associate. But then our balance sheet, we're going to increase by our share of the associate's earnings minus our share of its dividends, essentially. Okay, so I should actually put a little, I'm going to put a little percentage. We're going to increase it by our share of its earnings minus our share of its dividends. Now, again, we can see this 
uh, under the balance sheet investment here. Balance sheet investment, look, each year we're increasing the change in the balance sheet investment is equal to our share in the company times its earnings minus our share in the company times its dividends. Now, of course, earnings minus dividends, we could say, well, look, it's our share of the company times earnings minus dividends. And of course, earnings minus dividends is the change in retained earnings. So what essentially we're doing here is we're bringing in our share of the change in retained earnings. If we own 40% of this associate, we'll bring in 40% of its earnings minus 40% of its dividends. In other words, 40% of the change in its retained earnings. Notice in the income statement, we're just bringing in our share of its earnings. Now, also, we need to be aware, what gives us a clue that we've got influence over another entity? I think the one that I think is the most important is maybe we have some kind of uh, representation on the board of directors. So we've got a, a member on the board of directors. But somehow we're influencing the other entity in terms of its investing, its operating and its financing decisions. So maybe we've got some form of participation in policy making. Maybe material transactions between the parties, large uh, sales and purchases between the two companies, or maybe uh, one company is helping fund the other company by debt securities, etc. Maybe we share key personnel between the two companies, or maybe there's some form of technological dependency. So the associate may be de dependent on the parent's technology within its production process, something like that. Okay, key point though is this phrase. We have influence over the financing, the operating, and also the amount and timing of dividends. Okay, let's get into an example and have a quick look at this. So we've got Briatori here uh, investing 400 million in Palladini Enterprises for a 40% stake. Okay, so here's the cost of our investment, the original purchase price. We're spending 400 million and we're acquiring 40% of the voting share capital. Okay, and that occurred on the 1st of January X4. Earnings and dividends for the uh, next two years. So we've got 100 million earnings. Now notice this is our associate that we're looking at here. So data for the associate. We've got 100 million earnings in X4 and 20 million dividends. We've got 120 million in X5 and 30 million of dividends. Okay, so here we go. There's the opening balance here. The opening balance, notice, is simply the purchase price, that 400 million that we spend. So there's our original investment. Now, that's at the beginning of X4. What we're then going to do is bring in our share of its earnings. So its earnings in the year were 100 million. We own 40%. So 40% of 100 million, we're going to be able to bring in 40 million. And we're going to deduct our share of its dividends. Dividends 20 million, we own 40%, 40% of 20 million, 8 million. So notice therefore that essentially our investment is increasing by our share of the change in its retained earnings. Notice if it had earnings of 100 million, dividends of 20 million, the change in retained earnings for the associate was 80 million and we're bringing in essentially 40% of that being the 32 million. So at the end of the year now, our closing balance that we're going to see in the balance sheet for this investment is 432 million. Key point, that is the only figure that we see. Often we refer to equity accounting as being a one-line consolidation because we're going to see one line in the company's balance sheet, we're going to see one line in the company's income statement. Now, of course, let's have a look at the income statement. But with our income statement, notice we just show our share of its earnings. 100 million, we own 40%, we're going to bring in 40 million. Now, this immediately tends to trigger a question in class. And what people tend to say is, well, look, I can see that the balance sheet investment is increased by 32 million, but my earnings have increased by 40 million. Now, if my earnings have gone up by 40 million, then surely retained earnings have gone up by 40 million, equity has gone up by 40 million. If the balance sheet asset's only gone up by 32 million, how does the balance sheet balance? Asset up by 32 million, equity up by 40 million. Well, of course, the answer is the assets haven't just increased by 32 million. The other element is your cash. Your cash has gone up by 8 million, the dividend that you received, of course. 
Okay, let's have a look at X5. So our starting point, of course, is the, is the uh, closing balance from X4, 432 million. We're going to bring in 40% of 120 million, 48 million. We're going to bring in 40% of 30 million, 12 million. So this time, of course, our investment is increasing by 36 million. Again, our share of the change in retained earnings, change in its retained earnings this year, of course, 90 million, 120 less 30, my share of that 40, 40% 40 of 90, giving me 36. Okay, notice as well in the income statement, my earnings increase by my share or our share of its earnings, uh, so 40% of the 120 million, 48 million. Now the quick note, where does this appear in your company's income statement? Because it does have a, an implication for a, a later learning outcome in a later study session. Be aware that the equity income is shown after the tax line. Okay, so it's right at the bottom of the income statement. It's with all those discontinued operations, extraordinary items, and then we show income from associates. So it's after the tax line, just be a little bit aware of that. Now, okay, let's have a look. Let's make this example a little bit more uh, exciting. Let's try and uh, look at the purchase com price compared to book value. So again, we're going to use Briatori. 40% stake for 400 million, nothing changed there. But now we're going to look at some of Palladini's data. We've got the book value of its current assets, its PP&E. Uh, so notice 500 million, 950 million, giving us total assets of 1,450 million. And we've got its liabilities, 1,000 million, giving us a net asset figure of 450 million. But we've also been given the fair value. So this is its balance sheet adjusted to fair market values. And in particular, notice the PP&E. The book value is 950. The fair market value is 1.2 uh, billion, of course, 1,200 million. So there's a 250 adjustment to fair market value. Now, remember we refer to uh, equity accounting as a one-line consolidation, meaning at the moment of acquisition, all we are going to see is that 400 million. But in practice, that 400 million contains three elements. It contains, essentially, our share of the book value of the associate's net assets. It contains our share of any fair market value adjustments and the balancing figure is going to be goodwill. So I've heard people say goodwill does not exist on associates. Wrong. It does exist. It's just not showing up as a separate intangible. It's all wrapped up in this one figure. It's all wrapped up in the purchase price. Well, let's take this onto the next slide and let's try and break actually that 400 million down into those three component elements. So there's our purchase price. 40% of the net asset figure, well remember the net assets um, at book value, uh, the total assets 1.45 billion, total liabilities 1 billion, it had a net asset figure of 450 million. So 40% of 450 million and that gives us our 180. Okay, so just be aware of course there's the book value of the net assets were 450 million. Okay, then what we're saying is, look, there's also that PP&E adjustment of 250 million. There is the fair market value adjustment, 250 million. I own 40% of the associate, so let's bring in 40% of that, 100 million. Now, what we're then saying is, look at our 400 million. Let's deduct our share of the book value of its net assets. Let's deduct our share of the fair market value and anything left over is, of course, the goodwill. So what we're saying is, look, when we look at our balance sheet, all we're going to see is essentially 400 million. But in reality, that is composed of 180 million, our share of book value net assets. It consists of 100 million, which, of course, is our share of the fair market value adjustments, 
made on acquisition and it consists of 120 million of goodwill. So those are the component elements contained within that one line in the balance sheet and that is why we often refer to this as a one line consolidation. So yes, very, very key, the only figure we see on the face of the balance sheet is the 400 million. It does have 120 million goodwill contained within it, but remember, okay, it's there, the goodwill, it's just not a separate intangible. Okay, so notice our share, we can take those two figures and calculate them both simultaneously if we want. If we take our share of ownership, 40% times the fair market value of net assets, well again, if you go back to the previous slide, the fair market value of net assets was 700 million. That jumps us imme immediately to the 280 uh, million. So essentially, purchase price, less your share of net assets after making fair market value adjustments, gives you goodwill straight away. Okay, so let us make a little bit of an adjustment now to our data. So again, we're looking at 20x4. Remember we said that the uh, associate had made uh, earnings of 100 million and paid dividends of 20 million. So notice there we are, there we've got our share of its net income, 40% of 100 million, 40 million. Our share of its dividend, 40% of 20 million, 8 million. But now we're seeing amortization. What is this amortization? Well, it's to do with the fair market value adjustments. We should be aware that when we make fair market value adjustments, they will typically have knock-on implications in future income statements in particular and in future, uh, in future balance sheets as well. So let's have a look. What was the fair market value adjustment? Well, it was the adjustment that we made to adjust the plant, property and equipment from its book value of uh, 950 million to its fair value of 1.2 billion. Now, of course, the fair market value adjustment was an increase of 250 million. We own 40% of the company. That means essentially an increase for us of 100 million. Now, we're then going to amortize that according to whatever the company's policy is. Here, we're amortizing straight line over 10 years. Okay. So, essentially, notice that amortization is reducing the investment value. value. It's also going to show up in the income statement as well. Notice our original income in the income statement, of course, was 40 million. But we're also essentially reducing that for the amortization of the fair market value adjustment. Okay, so our equity income is 10 million lower and our year in investment is 10 million lower due to the amortization of fair market value adjustments. Now notice, therefore, that if we make large fair market value adjustments to things like PP&E, that actually has a knock-on impact via amortization or depreciation, in increased depreciation, hitting the accounts and therefore reducing the, the earnings in future periods. Therefore, maybe there's an incentive for the company to minimize the fair market value adjustments in order to maximize goodwill. Now, of course, hopefully goodwill doesn't have an impact on future income statements. Remember, it's no longer uh, amortized. Instead, it's only subject to annual impairment review. Now, let's talk about impairments now. Uh, IFRS says we have an impairment if the fair value has declined below the carrying value. Uh, fair value, of course, means really the estimated market value of this company. And if that's decline below carrying value, balance sheet value, and we do not believe it's temporary, then we have an impairment. US GAAP says fair value below carrying value and deemed to be permanent. Now, goodness me, near enough the same, aren't they? IFRS says it's not temporary. US GAAP says it's permanent. Fair enough. Now, notice IFRS does need some objective evidence that there has been an impairment. So what do they look for? Some kind of loss event uh, affecting your associate, maybe a massive decline in its sales, maybe loss of customers, that kind of stuff. So they're looking for a loss event that's going to impact on future cash flows, reduce future cash flows, and of course they're looking for reliable measurement here that we can put a monetary value on the impairment. Now notice then, here's our key point, 
Our balance sheet uh, asset needs to be written down to its fair value, its re recoverable amount, if you like. And the decline in the asset value down uh, to its fair value, the other side of that is taken as a loss, an unusual or infrequent item, of course, into the income statement. Now, remember I said, normally IFRS allows you to reverse impairments, US GAAP doesn't. This is the exception to the rule for IFRS because IFRS joins the US GAAP party and says no reversal of impairments. Why? Because they're so subjective. Look, in order to establish whether there's been an impairment, we need to know the fair value of our associate. Now, if our associate is a listed company, then that's not too difficult because we can look up its market capitalization and our fair value would be our share of that market cap. But of course, if our associate is unlisted, how do we know what the fair value of the company is? We're going to be reliant on valuation methodology, uh, and I spent quite a lot of time uh, valuing companies using valuation methodology, and essentially, uh, by tweaking my assumptions, I can really come up with almost any number under the sun. In other words, huge levels of subjectivity going into this fair value estimation. Even IFRS says, hey, look, there is too much danger here. If we allow you to record an impairment in this year and then reverse it in a subsequent year, that could be used for earnings management. It's so difficult to, to if you like, um, verify these fair value figures. We just better shut this off. Now again, notice our goodwill is not separately tested because essentially our goodwill is included in the investment price, the investment value that is sitting in our one-line consolidation on the face of the balance sheets. Transactions with associates. We talk about upstream transactions. We talk about downstream transactions. An upstream transaction, essentially, the profit or the, the associate is selling goods to the parent, so the profit is in the associate accounts. A downstream of transaction, the parent is selling goods to the associate, so the profit is in the parent's accounts. Now again, the idea here is the parent has influence over the associate and therefore it can influence the amount and timing. In other words, they could influence the sales price. What we're saying is these transactions are not at arm's length. Essentially, we've got, into, uh, we've got a related party transaction because we have influence over the associate. Now, notice the accounting treatment here. What we're going to have to eliminate is the pro rata share. Now, that just simply means our share. If we own 40%, we're going to eliminate 40% of the profit that has not been confirmed through resale. Now, if we sell the goods on to a third party, we then confirm the profit, so that's not a problem. So we're only worried about the profits that have not been confirmed through a resale to a third party or use within the business. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to eliminate those elements. Fair value options. Just be a little aware of fair value options. With, a fair, with a equity accounted investments, you do have a potential to treat them as if they were trading securities. In other words, in the balance sheet, we can record them at fair value and we can take changes in fair value, unrealized gains and losses directly into stockholders' equity. Notice for US GAAP, that is all associates, all affiliates can be treated in this way. For IFRS, it's far more restrictive. We can only really do that for investment vehicles. So venture capital funds, mutual funds, unit trusts. Now again, Essentially, most of their balance sheet assets will be uh, recorded at fair value there anyway. So balance sheet value is very close to fair market value uh, for these kind of vehicles. Notice it's an, a one-way election. So once you've made your decision, you are stuck with it. You can't go back to equity accounting at a later date. Again, notice then unrealized gains and losses to the income statement if we elect to record at fair value. Again, I look at this and I think, well, look, if we're recording a, a, a fair value, we're really treating this as if it was a trading security, okay, rather than equity accounting. So just be a little bit aware of that election. Analyst issues under equity accounting. Do we like it? Do we dislike it? Well, the basic rule is we dislike it as an analyst. Why? We dislike it because of the netting against assets and liabilities. 
Remember, it's this one-line consolidation idea. We're bringing all of these items in our one line in the balance sheet. Remember, we are seeing our share of its net assets, our share of any unamortized fair market value adjustments, and we're seeing goodwill. Okay, so we're seeing it all amalgamated together. What I'd really rather like to see, especially with this line here, I'd much really rather see my share of assets separately, my share of liabilities separately. So notice the netting of assets against liabilities typically obscures liabilities. It also rather obscures assets and will typically understate leverage. Now this is particularly an issue if your, your vehicle is very thinly capitalised. In other words, if assets are, and liabilities are similar sizes, equity is very small, you're bringing in your share of net assets, your share of equity, which is a tiny number. So it's going to have a very small impact on the balance sheet, even if this associate has massive assets and massive, li massive liabilities. So it can really distort the, the, the feel of the size of the associate when we bring in our share of net assets. Really don't like that. Likewise, in the income statement, all we're seeing is our share of net income. I'd much rather see my share of its sales, my share of its cost of goods sold, my share of its sales general admin, etc. So certainly I, I'm, I'm losing a lot of information in the income statement, but as well there's an impact on earnings quality. Because I'm bringing in my share of its earnings, but I'm actually receiving my share of the dividend that it pays out. In other words, if the dividend is lower than that year's earnings, and let's face it, it is, mo it is likely to be the case for most companies, most companies like to reinvest in themselves, then essentially a big chunk of the earnings that I'm bringing in from the associate are not backed by cash. And therefore there's an earnings quality issue. Remember, as an analyst, we like earnings to be supported by cash. Right, let's turn our attention now to business combinations. Here we're looking at the acquisition uh, method and we're really talking about subsidiaries. So we're talking about other companies that we control. We control the investing, we control the financing, we control the day-to-day -day business operations. So of course, uh, typically this has been owner over equity ownership over 50% because of course that would allow you to appoint and remove directors. Now let us focus on the balance sheet and the income statement. Now, of course, in the parent company's accounts, they're going to uh, essentially record any finance raised, debt and equity that they've raised in order to finance the acquisition. They then, of course, have a deduction of cash and they record an investment. OK, so you're going to have an investment account sitting in the parent's accounts. But when you look at the group account, that's not what we see. So let's take ourselves through the steps and have a look at this. What we're going to do is eliminate the investment account, the purchase price, of the parent. Uh, okay, so we're going to eliminate the investment sitting in the parent company's accounts and also we're going to el eliminate the equity accounts of the subsidiary. Now that appears a little bit a little bit odd essentially but the idea under the acquisition method sometimes referred to as consolidation we've got let's say uh, let's say we've got the parent company let's call it parent and it owns the subsidiary. Now what we're trying to do is create the illusion that these two companies are combined. There is only one company. And therefore, we're actually only interested in showing the shareholders' funds, the external share capital, for the parent company shareholders. Okay? The parent owns the subsidiary shares. We're trying to show these as if they're one combined entity. Okay, so we're going to eliminate the equity accounts of the subsidiary. Step two, we're going to create a minority interest. Now, if you own 100% of the shares in your subsidiaries, you're not going to see any minority interest. This only arises when we acquire subsidiaries owning less than 100% of the share capital. Now, the reason it acquires, well, the reason we see a minority interest is because we bring in 100% of the assets and liabilities even if we own less than 100% of the share capital. And that's because acquisition accounting reflects the assets and liabilities that you control 
rather than the assets and liabilities that you own. So the issue for us here is we're bringing in assets and liabilities that we don't actually own. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a minority interest and it sits in stockholders' equity. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as a non-controlling interest and that's just going to contain the net assets that belong to the minority shareholders. Now we're also going to calculate a goodwill figure. Uh, this time our goodwill is going to show up as a separate intangible asset. Then we combine 100% of the assets of the parent, 100% of the assets of the subsidiary, and we combine them on a line-by-line -line basis. We do exactly the same for liabilities. 100% of the liabilities in the parent, 100% of the liabilities in the subsidiary, and we combine them line for line. When we get to equity, as we said, we're only going to see the equity of the parent company. Okay, only eliminate pre-acquisition subsidiaries retained earnings. Yes, we'll talk about that in a second. In our income statements, uh, let's have a look at our income statement. So we're going to eliminate the subsidiary's earnings from the parent company. Now that's typically going to be dividends. It's likely that the, that the uh, subsidiary has paid dividends to the parent. We're going to eliminate them. Because rather than showing the, what we've actually received in terms of cash flows, we're going to bring in 100% of the subsidiary's earnings on a line-by-line -line basis. We're then going to subtract the minority share of earnings. Again, in the income statement, we show 100% of the revenues, 100% of the costs, even if they don't own 100% of the shares. In other words, we're bringing in earnings that don't belong to us, so right at the bottom of the income statement, we're going to deduct a minority interest represented, representing the earnings that belong to the minority shareholders. Then we combine the revenues and expenses of both firms, net of intercompany transactions. Now note, I've made a note here that we only include post-acquisition results. In other words, any results that were generated prior to the date of the acquisition belong to the pre-existing shareholders, belong to the prior shareholders, not us. So at the date of acquisition, all of the income statement uh, for the subsidiary is pre-acquisition and cannot be included. So typically in the exam, we're going to be creating a consolidated income statement one year after the date of acquisition. That means all of the results in the subsidiary are post-acquisition and can be included. Now, of course, what that does mean is at the date of at the acquisition, the income statement is just the parent company's income statement because the subsidiary's results are all pre-acquisition. Okay, let's have a little look at our example now. So on the 1st of January, parent has acquired 75% of subsidiary and there's the purchase price, 110 million. Now again, remember that's going to be sitting in the investments, investment line of the parent company's balance sheet. Okay, let's have a look at our balance sheets now. We've got the parent company, current assets, 370 million euros, goodwill, zero. Ah, oh, there's the investment sitting in the parent company's accounts. Notice 110 million. And then we've got the fixed assets of 320 million, bringing our parent company's accounts to 800 million. We've then got some detail for the subsidiary here. We've got its current assets, 160 million, the goodwill zero, in no investments held by the subsidiary, and finally fixed assets of 80. So let's have a look at our, our first adjustment. <laughs> now our two first adjustments, one and three, number one, we're going to eliminate the investment in the, uh, in the group account. So the consolidated accounts do not show the investment at purchase price. Now the reason for that is we're going to bring in all of the assets, all of the liabilities of the subsidiary and goodwill. Now, by definition, those three elements will total the investment value. So if you show the investment value plus you show all of the assets, liabilities and goodwill, you essentially double count everything. So we're eliminating the investment value. We're eliminating the investment value because we're going to replace it with assets, liabilities and goodwill. Okay, we've also got a goodwill computation there of 35 million. Now, of course, what that's going to do is that's going to take our proceeds and compare it to the net assets that we've acquired, our share of net assets that we've acquired after we've made fair market value adjustments. And we're going to see that on the uh, next slide. So what we then do is we add across on a line-by-line -line basis. 
So 370 million plus the subsidiary 160 million gives us 530. Note very clearly that we've brought in 100% of the current assets even though we only own 75% of the equity. Remember, uh, acquisition accounting essentially brings in all of the assets and liabilities that you control rather than necessarily only the assets and liabilities that you own. So we brought in 100% of those assets. Same with the fixed assets, we brought in 100% of those. So we now add across. So 370 plus 160 gives us 530 million in the consolidated financial statements. Goodwill, 35 million. We'll look at how that's computed on the next slide. The investment cancels down to zero. It's in the parent company's accounts. It is not in the consolidated accounts. And the fixed assets, 320 plus 80, taking us to 400 million. Let's total down our assets. 530 plus 35 plus 400. We've got total assets totaling 965. Now, of course, if our total assets equal 965, then our total liabilities should equal 9652. Well, total liabilities plus equity, I should say, should total 965. Remember, our old balance sheet equation, assets equal liabilities plus equity. So now that we know that this is 965, then, of course, these two must be 965 as well. Okay. Now, I did promise that I'd explain that partial goodwill figure on the previous slide. Now, we're calculating partial goodwill here. We're going to see a little bit later that there's another measure of goodwill known as full goodwill. Let's take our partial goodwill. We're going to compare the proceeds to our share, 75%, of the fair market value of net assets. So we take the subsidiary's assets and liabilities. We adjust any asset and liability from book value up to fair market value, and then we look at the net assets. Now, in our example at the moment, we haven't got any fair market value adjustments, but again, we're going to illustrate an example in class with you guys that does show you those. Okay, so let's have a look at our total uh, assets. Our total assets were 240 million on the previous uh, slide. Our total liabilities here, 140 million. So 240 minus 140, that of course gives us net assets of 100 million. Well, of course, net assets are also equal to stockholders' equity, 100 million. So we're bringing in 75% of 100 million and comparing that to the proceeds that we paid. And notice the excess is our 35 million, our goodwill. So compare the proceeds to your share of the net assets of the subsidiary after you've made fair market value adjustments, and that's how we calculate partial goodwill. Okay, so let's now turn our attention to the bottom of our balance sheet. Now, two adjustments to make. We need to bring in the minority interests. So this is going to be the minority share of the company's net assets after making fair market value adjustments. So the minority share is 25. The net assets of this company, well, remember, we haven't got any fair market value adjustments in this example. So the fair market value of net assets is the same as the book value of net assets, i.e. the 100 million. 25% of 100 million gives us 25 million, and that's my minority interest. Now again, remember, when we're looking at equity, we eliminate the equity in the subsidiary. What we want to see is the external equity held by the parent company's shareholders. So any equity in the subsidiary is going to be eliminated. Any common stock, any additional paid in capital. What about retained earnings? Well, retained earnings at the date of the acquisition are eliminated. Once we go beyond the date of the acquisition, then we can bring in our share of any post-acquisition retained earnings. Now, I think it is very unlikely that you're going to be doing this in the exam. But what you would do at dates after the balance sheet is you would look at the subsidiary's retained earnings at the current balance sheet date, the subsidiary's retained earnings at the date of acquisition, and the difference is post-acquisition retained earnings, and you can bring in your share. So we'll be bringing in 75% of those. Here we're looking at a balance sheet at the date of acquisition, so all of the subsidiary's uh, equity is pre-acquisition, and we're going to eliminate it. We then just need to add across our liabilities. So notice our liabilities, 400 plus 140, that gives us 540. 
The minority interest, which is a component of stockholders' equity, goes in there at 25 million. And stockholders' equity, 400 million uh, plus 100 minus 100. Again, remember, we're eliminating the equity, uh, bringing us down to 400 million. Let's total that up. 540 plus 25 plus 400. And hey, there we go. 965. It all agrees, thankfully, with uh, it all agrees with our assets. So assets do indeed equal liabilities and equity. Let's turn our attention now to the income statement. Notice we're producing it one year after acquisition. Why? So that all of these data in the subsidiary are post acquisition. Remember, we are only allowed to include the post acquisition results. So at the date of acquisition, if this was at the date of acquisition, all of the data for the uh, subsidiary would be irrelevant. I could only show the parent company's balances. Okay, we're one year after acquisition, so all of our subsidiary's balances are perfectly valid here. So what we're going to do is make our adjustments. First of all, uh, income from the subsidiary. Notice the parent has 20 million. This must be a dividend that has been paid from the subsidiary up to the parent. We need to eliminate that. We're not going to show the dividends received. Instead, we're going to show 100% of the revenues, 100% of the expenses, 100% of the earnings. So if you show the dividend as well, you get a double counting. So we're eliminating the income and we're going to show a minority interest. This is the minority's share of the company's earnings. Now again, we're going to bring in 100% of revenues, 100% of expenses, even though we only own 75% of the company. So in other words, we're bringing in all 40 million of earnings, but we only actually own 30 million of the earnings, and therefore the minority interest is going to represent the earnings that we do not own. So let's have a look at that. Uh, again, you can see essentially the minority interest, the minority owns 25% of the 40 million, which is where we get the 10 million from. Okay, so then we add across the revenues line by line, 100% of the parent, 100% of the subsidiary, 800 million. Same with the expenses, 400 million plus 160 million, that gives us 560. The income from the subsidiary cancels down to zero and we report a minority interest. It's a negative figure. Okay, and that brings us down to 230 million, which is essentially the earnings attributable to our shareholders.